stumbled across a book not long ago by Ted Koppel, who uh, you may remember was the longtime host of ABC's evening news program Nightline. Uh, the, the book is titled Lights Out, which in Koppel's esteemed journalistic style, uh, investigates the prospect of a major cyber attack on America's power grid. Now, <laughs> the reason such a, a title stood out to me in the first place is because a couple years ago, I read the best-selling novel by William Forstchen called One Second After about an imagined detonation of three nuclear warheads high above North America uh, that produce an electromagnetic pulse that wipes out the entire power grid instantly, flinging the whole country back to a, a pre-modern society that is entirely unprepared uh, to take care of itself. Just imagine one day going about your business and all of a sudden the lights go out, along with all refrigeration, all communication, all news, all gas pumps, all elevators, all oxygen machines, all sewage treatment plants, and on and on. Not just in, in one isolated city, but everywhere. It's, it's a classic dystopian story. Um, as a homesteader, I guess I took interest in seeing how those with old-fashioned do-it-yourself skills were portrayed in the novel as being the ones able to best cope with such a disaster. And then to find out in a sobering forward to the book by former House Speaker Newt Gingrich that as entertaining and far-fetched as the story may seem, the danger of an EMP attack on the grid is one of those things uh, Congress and the White House have actually been briefed on. I, I found that surprising. Well, having read that novel, Ted Koppel's book caught my eye since it's not a novel at all, but rather a, a kind of real-life investigative report. Um, and though it doesn't speak directly to the whole EMP issue, it, it does deal with another potential danger to our nation uh, that would produce practically the same outcome, and that is the threat of a major cyber attack on the power grid. It's been said that though a large-scale EMP would certainly have devastating consequences to our modern way of life, the probability of such an event isn't very high considering the relatively few number of groups out there, or I should say governments out there, uh, that have access to a nuclear arsenal. The ability to launch a cyber attack, however, is something not only shared by the world's most powerful governments, but by an untraceable number of programmers and hackers out there, some, uh, some who are nothing more than teenagers looking to make trouble from their parents' basements. It's one thing to keep tabs on what ICBMs are being launched into the skies. It's, it's something totally different to keep track of all the computer viruses being transmitted through emails and, and exchanged on thumb drives. In his book, Koppel addresses what he sees as a legitimate threat to the grid in three parts. In the first part, he gives attention to the threat itself, uh, looking not only at the rise of cyber crimes in general, from examples of ransomware to malware uh, that happens every single day and keeps uh, our IT professionals constantly on their toes, but also the surprising vulnerability of America's power grid should a directed cyber attack ever occur on that critical uh, part of our infrastructure. Speaking toward the danger of cyber attacks in general, Koppel reminds the reader of several instances when malicious attacks and data breaches have happened both in the private sector and the government. Our collective memory and attention span is usually limited to the most recent news cycle or whatever coverage the media thinks will get the highest viewership, so uh, it's easy to forget these things have happened and are happening. Many examples are given, but, but one of the big ones reported on was back during the Bush and Obama administrations when several coordinated attacks with the help of Israel's military, codenamed Olympic Games, were launched to interfere with Iran's progress and its nuclear program by sending a computer worm that temporarily took out nearly 1,000 of Iran's 5,000 centrifuges used to purify uranium. Uh, now, one's got to wonder if we can do it to them, um, if they could do it to us. Even as, as recent as this year, and I'm recording this in uh, 2021, there was the Colonial Pipeline ransomware attack that shut down oil production operations for the better part of a week. Uh, in this case, it wasn't even a recognized government that pulled it off, but a hacker group called DarkSide, believed to be located somewhere in Eastern Europe, most likely Russia. The point is, the capability is out there, and if we can take out their nuclear centrifuges and they can take out our oil pipelines, who's to say 
someone won't ever try taking out the power grid itself. In terms of the vulnerability of the grid, Koppel makes the claim America's electrical system um, as a whole is far more fragile than key players would like to admit. The first interesting fact to note is how North America uh, is really comprised of only three interconnecting grids, those being the Eastern Grid, the Western Grid, and the Texas Grid. <laughs> Gotta love how Texas has its own. But Koppel writes, quote, There are three power grids that generate and distribute electricity throughout the United States, and taking down all or any part of a grid would scatter millions of Americans in a desperate search for light, while those unable to travel would tumble back into something uh, approximating the mid-19th century. In other words, the country is so interconnected in its electricity, uh, if you're able to take down just one of the three major parts of the system, it would be mass chaos affecting millions upon millions of people. Back in August 2003, there was uh, a high-voltage power line in northern Ohio that brushed up against some trees that produced a cascading surge of current that produced a large-scale shutdown. Normally, a problem like that would have tripped an alarm to contain the outage, but on that day, the alarm failed, and like dominoes, failures started happening across eight northeastern states and throughout southeastern Canada. In all, I think something like 50 million people, 50 million, lost power for up to two days, resulting in at least 11 deaths and countless stories of horrifying experiences. In fact, I think New York City was one of the places affected by the outage, and, and you can YouTube sometime the chaos that resulted in the subways and the elevators throughout the city. You can just imagine. The point is, it's happened, and much by accident. A couple of tree branches falling at just the right spot. Well, imagine if an even more critical spot on the grid was targeted intentionally by cyber attack. Koppel explains how each of the three main grids in North America are dependent on a series of large-scale transformers, some of which are now already decades old, which are manufactured overseas, take some time to manufacture, and are so large that they take special shipping and trucking arrangements to get them where they're going. Not only that, but spare parts to these things aren't believed to be kept in great supply since they're uh, so, since the units are so big, they can't exactly keep a few extras in the supply closet. All that to say, if you take out a key number of these transformers, instead of having power restored in a couple of days, you're looking at a couple of months, if not longer, depending on how bad the damage is. Now, I'll let that scenario sink in for a moment. What would it mean for our country if we lost power for several months? Whatever it would mean, that the country would be totally unprepared for it, which is why in the second part of the book, Koppel talks about just how unprepared we are. Actually, as a kind of preview at the beginning of the book, he paints a grim picture of what it would be like. Uh, it's one thing to lose lights, refrigeration, running water, flushing toilets, access to banks, full shelves of, of groceries at the store until the trucks can refill their gas tanks to get to you. Uh, but there again, that's only for a couple days. What would happen if it took months? Not even thinking about those in nursing home settings or hospital situations that are dependent on 24-7 care, uh, I imagine families would get by as best they could, as long as they could, with whatever resources they already had on hand. They'd probably cook up on the old charcoal grill whatever was beginning to thaw in the freezer. They would use up whatever bottled water they had in the fridge. They would eat through the, the non-perishables they had in their pantry. And then they'd wait for FEMA to show up to save the day, right? Well, Koppel goes on to explain that as helpful as they are, FEMA, the Red Cross, and other disaster entities are simply not equipped to handle the kind of large-scale, long-term emergency a widespread power failure would produce. Not even the National Guard, if activated, would be able to meet all the needs. For example, in a state like New York, uh, where you have over 17 million people, assuming the government has a stockpile of 20 to 30 million MREs, that being meals ready to eat on hand, uh, just do the math. You've only covered a little more than uh, one or two meals for every mouth to feed. Not only is the government not equipped to handle the immediate aftermath of such an event, there's not even a viable contingency of what to do when all the MREs run out. 
Using New York City as an example, what do you do with all those hungry people? I guarantee the store shelves and warehouses installed trucks on the road will be picked clean in less than a day or two. What's the next move? Do you tell everybody to shelter in place and starve? Or do you attempt a large-scale evacuation and trigger all-out pandemonium? Even if you could evacuate that many people, how would you transport them without an ample supply of gas? And where would they all go since everyone around them uh, is in the same boat they are? There is no good solution. If there was ever an enemy that wanted to inflict a striking blow to America, the power grid would be the place to punch. I won't detail how quickly and how severely society would plunge into medieval Dark Age conditions. You can read the book for yourself. But the scary thing is, it's not just a scene from a dystopian novel. It's the scene of what a professional journalist warns could very likely happen if the right safeguards aren't put in place. In fact, according to CENTCOM Commander General Lloyd Austin, um, it's not even a question of if, it's a question of when. It's something President Obama mentioned as a concern in in two of his State of the Union addresses, if you go back and listen to them. It's something former Defense Secretary Leon Panetta has warned could amount to a coming cyber Pearl Harbor. And the fact is, the country isn't ready. At least, not all of the country is ready. In the third part of his book, Koppel looks at those who are prepared, or I should say, those who are more prepared than most. He looks at several different groups as examples to think about. Of course, the the first group that comes to mind is the prepper community. Um, As crazy of a reputation as a lot of preppers have, the irony is, in the event of a real-life catastrophe, they're the ones most likely to survive it. (laughs) I, I once heard a guy comment, preppers may be crazy, but they're not as crazy as they used to be. Even if you're like me and you can't buy into the the real necessity of digging a bunker and lining the walls with years' worth of freeze-dried food to be able to survive the apocalypse, you may find it interesting that FEMA itself has put out recommendations for every household to follow as standard preparations, standard preparations in the event of an emergency. Quote, if an earthquake, hurricane, winter storm, or other disaster, perhaps cyber attack could be included in that list, Uh, In in the event something like this strikes your community, you might not have access to food, water, and electricity for days or even weeks. By taking some time now to store emergency food and water supplies, you can provide for your entire family. End quote. We're so dependent on going to the grocery store every week, it seems silly to us to ever think beyond one week's shopping list. But if you stop and think about it, every generation before the trucking industry would say, actually, it's that kind of thinking that's the real crazy. Preppers aren't wrong for not expecting Walmart and Kroger to always be there to feed their family. In addition to the prepper community, couple points to everyday rural farmers, ranchers, and homesteaders as another best likely group to deal with a downed grid. Except in their case, it's not a matter of the supplies they've stockpiled, which supplies can always run out, right? But because of the skills and the way of life those in the rural community typically have. Whether it's hunting, uh, trapping, gardening, animal husbandry, rainwater collection, well water access, knowledge of of all natural uh, medicines, those in the country have, by and large, already learned to survive either in whole or in part without a lifeline to modern conveniences. For that matter, there's usually already a mutual agreement between neighbors in rural areas not only to keep a protective eye on one another's properties, but to exchange through their own little barter system, their own little barter economy, different things uh, that one another has. It is a culture altogether lost in so many urban settings. A third group Cobble talks about, which uh, I I found both surprising and fascinating, was the Mormon community. The Mormons. Little did I know, it's a teaching in the Mormon church to be prepared, whether that's for the end times or, or simply out of a concern for persecution or something else. Not only are all Mormon families encouraged to keep a three-month supply of food and water on hand, but in Salt Lake City, get this, in Salt Lake City, there is an enormous complex on the scale of Costco or Walmart with building after building filled 30 or 40 feet high with pallets containing everything from, uh, from food supplies to truck tires. 
There are also underground tanks of diesel fuel with an estimated storage capacity of 250,000 gallons of fuel to be used by a trucking service exclusively owned by the Mormon church to make their distributions. Also a part of every local Mormon ward, as they call it, or what we would call a congregation, there is a well-stocked food pantry called the Bishop's Storehouse, available specifically to care for church members in need. I I didn't realize it, but being prepared is built into the Mormon culture. Brigham Young once told his followers, quote, If you are without bread, how much wisdom can you boast? And of what real utility are your talents if you cannot procure for yourself and save against a day of scarcity those substances designed to sustain your natural lives? While I can't endorse what I know about Mormon theology, I am intrigued by their practice of taking care of their members, especially in the event of an emergency. Well, again, the name of the book is Lights Out by Ted Koppel. It's an interesting read. Makes you think, makes you regret perhaps how dependent we've all allowed ourselves to be on electricity. And like a good journalist, he leaves it up to the reader to decide for himself what to do with the information. Well, with that said, I'll end it there and encourage you to like and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. Uh, Stay tuned for more episodes to come. Until then, thanks for listening and God bless. Thank you.